So I want to tell you today, I want to start by talking about what I think are some of the key challenges in human genomics research. The first is that we need to do a much better job characterizing both genomic and phenotypic variation in ethnically diverse populations from across the globe. We want to understand what are the evolutionary processes that generate and maintain that variation, and how do gene-gene, gene-protein, and gene-environment interactions contribute both to normal variation and disease risk. The focus of my research is in Africa. There are a number of reasons for that, one of which is that Africa is the um, location of origin of all modern humans. These red dots represent the locations of fossils of anatomically modern humans, the oldest of which is dated to around 300,000 years ago. We also have some uh, early evidence of modern human behavior. This is, uh, was found in a cave in South Africa, and these uh, drawings. And then even earlier, they found this, which was describing as sort of an artist toolkit because it had pigment in there. People were using it for mixing the pigments, either for adorning their own bodies or for cave painting. And then, okay, now I'm going to try out, try out this cool thing. <laughs> Again, very old school here. Um, so after this origin in Africa, somewhere around 50 to 80,000 years ago, populations, in small, relatively small numbers of individuals migrated out of Africa, giving rise to populations across the globe. And we now know that when they left, they ran into archaic populations like Neanderthals and Denisovans, that there was some small amount of interbreeding, such that somewhere between around 2% to say 5% of the genomes of non-Africans are derived from those archaic populations. Now this was probably happening uh, in Africa as well, but we just, it's harder to detect because we don't have any good ancient reference genomes. So how much do we differ if we were to compare genomes between anyone in the room? Well, let's start with identical twins actually. In theory, there should be zero differences. If we compared two genomes, on average, say one out of a thousand nucleotides, but that will depend on what your ancestry is. If we compare human to chimp, it's about one out of a hundred. Human versus mouse, one out of thirty. Human versus broccoli, two out of three. <laughs> so given that there are three billion DNA bases, that's around three million differences uh, between genomes. And now that we've started routinely doing genome sequencing, that's pretty much what we've been finding. Now, this is funny. This is, I call this Estee Lauder's version of ethnic diversity amongst beautiful people. But <laughs> even amongst the rest of us, our genomes are really, really similar, less than 0.1% divergence. And that's reflecting that recent African origin. But there's also a considerable amount of structural variation. So those can be insertions and deletions and rearrangements. Um, that some think may actually be contributing a large portion of the variation between genomes, but they're very hard to detect, and we're still at the beginning of understanding that variation. But for the past, I don't know, at least 60 years or so, it's been clear that the majority of genetic variation is within populations relative to between populations. Now, the other thing that motivates my research is to try to understand risk factors for health disparities. So for example, um, hypertension is more common in people of African ancestry than other groups. And uh, type 2 diabetes is more common in people of Native American ancestry compared to other ethnic groups. Now undoubtedly, there are major socio-demographic risk factors, things like diet, things like access to health care. Some might say systemic racism is playing a role in these health disparities. But it's also thought that there may also be underlying genetic risk factors as well. And one of the challenges is how do we distinguish the genetic from environmental factors that are influencing disease risk? And as we showed in this uh, perspective a couple of years ago, we looked at the Genome-Wide Association Study Catalog and showed that about 80% of the individuals um, included in these genomic studies are of European ancestry. About 10% uh, are East Asian, or Asian ancestry, 
about 2% uh, African ancestry, 1% Hispanic ancestry, and less than 1% everybody else. And if we look at other common, uh, commonly used databases like NOMAD and GTEx, we can see this major European bias. I think that's a real problem for a number of reasons. Um, I think that it impedes our ability to fully understand the genetic risk factors for human disease, and it could actually exasperate health inequalities. Our ability to translate genetic research into clinical practice or public health policy could be incomplete, or even worse, it could be mistaken. It could result in inaccurate assessment of pathogenic variants in clinical genomic studies, and one of the reasons for that is that one of the criteria for determining if a variant of unknown significance is pathogenic is how common it is, so the idea being if it's common, it's unlikely to be very pathogenic. But maybe it's not common in Europeans, but it's common in other populations. And then also attempts to use estimates of genetic risk from European-based studies and non-Europeans could result in inaccurate assessment of risk and lack of appropriate interventions. So I want to talk about that just for a moment. I realize that this audience is very diverse, um, but I want to talk about what a polygenic risk score is. When you do a genome-wide association study, you're looking at variable sites across the genome, and you're looking for an association with a trait or with a disease. Let's say it's heart disease, for example. You're going to look at all the regions of all these variants that associate with risk for disease, and the thought is that they should be physically pretty close to the causal mutations. And if you basically um, just add up the weighted sum of the effect sizes of all these genetic variants for a trait, you'll get a polygenic risk score. So for example, somebody, if they had a lot of the variants that are associated with risk for heart disease, they'd be at the high end of that distribution. And people are actually applying this in the clinic and elsewhere. But as um, has been shown, this was based on a simulation study by Alicia Martin and colleagues that, um, but this has been proven in empirical data that when you do these estimate a polygenic risk score in European populations, which is what's typically done, it just doesn't do very well for predicting the risk for disease in people of other diverse ancestries, and it does particularly poorly in people of African ancestry. So why is that? There are a number of reasons. One is, remember I said when you do a GWAS, you're looking at an association between um, a variant that is tagging the causal variant. Very rarely do we actually find what the causal variant is. Because of the demographic history that I mentioned to you, um, there's different patterns of what we call linkage disequilibrium. And a, something that's a tag variant in a European might be different than in Asians or in Africans, for example. Now, there are ways that we could try to find better tags. So maybe it's the exact same causal variant. We just have to find better tags in these different populations. There are ways to try to do that. But the other alternative is that maybe there are different variants. Maybe there are even different genes that are playing a role due to demographic history and natural selection in different regions. And if that's the case, we're never going to find them if we don't look in ethnically diverse populations. So I mentioned these first two, and then lastly, different, there can be different effect sizes in different populations due to differences in allele frequency, gene by gene, gene and gene by environment effects. Now I realize I'm speaking in the wrong direction, so I better move over here. <laughs> you said I'm supposed to speak this way. Um, so I'm going to tell you now about my research in Africa. So I want to tell you a bit about the ethnic diversity there. There are over 2,000 populations that speak uh, different languages, and those languages are classified into language families based on similarities. So in blue is the distribution of the Afroasiatic languages, mainly in northern and east uh, in the Horn of Africa. In red is the distribution of populations that speak Nilo-Saharan languages. These are mainly in Central and East Africa. They tend to practice pastoralist lifestyle and dairying. Uh, you might have heard of the Maasai, for example, in East Africa. The most widespread language family is shown in orange, Niger Kordofanian, also known as Niger Congo. And that originated in West Africa. 
And the largest subfamily are the Bantu languages. So the Bantu, these people in the, who spoke Niger-Congo languages, had developed around 5,000 years ago um, iron tool technologies and something called slash and burn agriculture. So they were able to cut down the trees to grow crops and then sustain large population sizes. So they were very successful in spreading across Africa. We think to the east and south and to the west and south, where they then interbred with the local populations. And so they've really shaped the genomic landscape in Africa. And then in green, we can see the distribution of populations that are labeled as Khoisan. These uh, languages have cliques, which I can't do very well. But they would include the San hunter-gatherers in southern Africa, and then two groups in Tanzania, the Hadza and the Sandawe, who either continue to practice hunting and gathering or did until recently. So all of the research that I'm going to present is done in partnership with a number of uh, researchers throughout Africa shown here. And I thought I'd show you a little bit of what that work is like. Um, so this is from uh, Ethiopia. We are mainly studying minority populations in Africa that are practicing more traditional lifestyles. So they tend to live in very remote areas requiring use of a four-wheel drive vehicle. We have to bring all the supplies with us. Here in Tanzania at the top, you can see this is how we're doing some of the biometric measurements. And in the upper right and lower left are members of the Hadza tribe of hunter-gatherers. And then in the upper left, this would be a woman who speaks a Nilo-Saharan language and practices pastoralism. You can see quite a bit of diversity in Botswana. And this is one of her last trips before COVID, which was to Cameroon. And these are some of my colleagues from the University of Yaoundé Medical School and people in my lab who contributed to the study. So wherever we go, we're really careful to do this research in an ethical manner. And what that means is not just getting IRB approval at our universities, but we go through many, many rounds of ethical review in each country. We also spend a lot of time in the communities translating into the local language and sort of discussing in layman's terms what we're doing, what the benefits or risks are, if, if any. And it's only after we get community consent and ultimately individual consent that we do this research. We also think it's really important to return results to participants. We're not at this point returning individual genetic results, but sort of at the population level. I can tell you that people are really appreciative. I think it's a way of benefit sharing and avoiding what's called helicopter genetics. Training and capacity building in Africa is also very important. And I've had the honor of training a number of grad students and postdocs from Africa with the hope that they will go back and build infrastructure there for science, for genomics specifically. So um, in these regions, we're collecting blood. And from blood, we can get RNA and DNA and plasma. We get fecal samples to look at the gut microbiome and urine samples to look at metabolism. We get very detailed ethnographic information and information about diet and um, any medical information they have, which is often limited because they're uh, very far from clinics, health clinics typically. And then we have to process uh, these samples in places with no electricity. So now what we do, it's kind of off the screen to the lower left, but um, we just bring a generator with us and we can set that up in the bush <laughs> and just have our lab in the bush. So the kind of phenotypic uh, diversity that we measure is what we can do in a non-invasive manner. So very detailed anthropometric measurements, height, weight, limb length, limb circumference, for example. We look at a number of cardiovascular, lung, and blood phenotypes. We look at metabolic function and infectious disease status when we can. And then we're integrating different types of omics data, uh, looking at how they influence each other and also are influenced by environmental factors and diet and how together they're shaping uh, variation in these populations and disease risk. 
Now, the thing about these populations is that they live in very diverse environments, but within any particular uh, region, because it's so rural, there's not a lot of variation. People are not going shopping at the grocery store, for example. And so that helps to control for some of the noise when you're trying to figure out the role of genetics and environment in a variable trait. One of the things we can do, for example, is compare people who are, have the same genetic ancestry but living in a rural versus an urban uh, area. So for example, right now we're actually studying uh, African immigrants in Philadelphia. It's of interest to compare people who are living a traditional lifestyle in Africa and those who come to the US and have a very altered uh, lifestyle. Now we can also do the opposite. We can look at people who have different genetic ancestry as indicated by the different colors here, but live in a similar environment. And this population in the upper left, the Fulani, is one that we're particularly interested in for reasons that nobody fully understands. They have a relative uh, resistance to malaria infection. And we've also observed a high incidence of hypertension and adult onset diabetes. We're trying to understand why that is because their average BMI is only 19. So this is from a study we did a number of years ago, but it remains one of the largest genomic studies amongst ethnically diverse Africans. These different colors represent inferred genetic ancestry. And then we've pooled individuals by population or by region. And what you can see by all the colors is how much variation there is in Africa and that populations in Eastern and Western and Central and Northern and Southern Africa are genetically very divergent. And the other thing you could see by all the colors, even within a region, is how much admixture there's been. So in interbreeding between groups from different ethnic groups. Now, um, or between individuals from different ethnic groups. So you can also see from the faces here quite a bit of phenotypic variation. And that reflects, again, the demographic history in Africa and adaptation to different environments. So I first want to tell you about a study that we did. Um, this was actually in collaboration with David Reich and using data from the Simons Genome Diversity Project. So very, thank you very much for funding that project. As part of that, um, we generated high coverage whole genome sequences from 94 individuals from 44 African populations. So greatly expanding our knowledge of genomic variation in Africa. From this data, you can construct a phylogenetic tree. So at the end of each of these branches is a population. If they cluster near each other, they're genetically similar to each other. And we see consistently, many studies have shown that the San populations have the most basal lineages. They're kind of at the root of this tree. And then followed by uh, Central African hunter-gatherers, commonly referred to as pygmies. And then we see clustering by geographic region, Western Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa. And if I put up there would be non-African. So they have the subset of the diversity we see in Africa. So we used um, coalescent modeling to try to infer the changes in the effect of population size of these populations going backwards in time. And what's interesting is we can see that there starts to be differentiation around 250,000 years ago, close to the time of origin of modern humans. And in the past, you can ignore the stuff that's recent. This method actually doesn't do very well for recent times. But from 50,000, say, to more than 100,000 years ago, the San and the Pygmies, who have a very small census size today, had the largest effect of population size compared to other Africans. And if we were to put non-Africans on here, it would be right around here, around 10,000. So Africans generally have more diversity and have maintained a bigger size than non-Africans. We can also use this approach to compare genomes between individuals and to infer the time of population divergence with a number of caveats. But like many people have shown, the oldest divergence is between the San and all other populations. Could have been as much as 160,000 years ago. We see a pretty old divergence between the San and some of the hunter-gatherer groups like the Pygmies and Hadza and Sandawe at around 70 to 85,000 years ago. 
And then if we look at divergence between people speaking Niger-Kordofanian, Afro-Asiatic, Nilo-Saharan languages, they diverged around 16,000 to around 34,000 years ago. But even two groups, like these are two groups of San who sp speak slightly different languages, and they're estimated to have diverged around 30,000 years ago. So the history in Africa is these very subdivided populations, and then we have both long-range and short-range migration and admixture, particularly in the past 5,000 years. Now, more recently, we've expanded to do high-coverage whole genome sequencing in 180 ethnically diverse Africans. We find millions of variants, and about 17% of these are novel. They're not in any current database. Of those, many are predicted to be functional, either altering the coding region of genes, or more often, they're in predicted regulatory regions. So that gives you a sense. That's only 180 individuals of how much diversity is out there. One of the things that we did with this data is we want to look at population-specific adaptations or local adaptations. One way we can do this is using something called the FST statistic, which is just a measure of genetic differentiation. You can do this for every variant across the genome. And what we're basically doing is we're comparing multiple populations. So let's say we're going to focus on the pygmy population and compare to the Yoruba agriculturalists and the Maasai pastoralists. And we want to know what variants are very differentiated in the pygmies relative to these groups who would be more similar to each other. Now, after we do that, we get thousands of variants. And then you can ask the question, what are the genes that are near those variants? And what are those genes doing? So looking at things like gene ontology databases. And that gives you an idea of local adaptation to different environments. So I'm just going to tell you about a couple today. First, I'll tell you about the uh, Baca uh, pygmies in Central Africa. So what's interesting is we look at what the function is of these genes that are very different in this population. And we can see an enrichment for genes that play a role in bone development and chondrocyte differentiation, for example. And that's interesting because of the short stature phenotype they have, which is thought to be an adaptation to a tropical environment. The other thing I'll mention is um, what we found for the Hadza hunter-gatherers in Tanzania. And you'll see it's quite different, and it's pretty remarkable, that we see this enrichment for genes that play a role in cardiac muscle morphogenesis. So um, we are actually doing a lot of follow-up studies using iPSCs that were uh, induced pluripotent stem cells that were differentiating into heart cells, cardiomyocytes. And then actually, a cardiologist at Penn wants to come with us. Hopefully this summer we can go back and actually look at heart function in more detail in this population. Because the thought is it might be an adaptation to this hunting and gathering lifestyle in a very dry, arid region. So now I want to tell you about phenotypic variation in these populations for a number of traits. And this is work done by Matt Hansen in my lab. And he integrated that data with single nucleotide polymorphism data for around 2,000 sites, or pop, I'm sorry, 2,000 individuals, as shown in the, on this map from diverse populations. And they have very different diets. So hunter-gatherers have a diet that's heavy in nuts and tubers and, to a lesser extent, meat. The pastoralists have a diet that's heavy in milk and blood and, to a lesser extent, meat. And agriculturalists have a diet heavy in grains and fruits and tubers. So let's start with some of the anthropometric traits. So if we look at height, for example, and we're just looking at women here, just for females. And we've color-coded by the subsistence pattern. And we could see at the very low end of height are the hunter-gatherers. The very lowest are the Baca pygmies. At the high end are some of the pastoralist groups and some of the food-producing agriculturalists. If we look at BMI, at the low end are some of the East African pastoralists. They tend to have a very tall, thin body type. And it's thought that might be an adaptation to their environment. And at the high end tends to be the food-producing populations. Not too surprising. 
If we look at waist circumference, um, similar trends at the low end are all of the San populations from Southern Africa, and at the high end are some of the food producing groups and the Herero. And if we look at um, percent body fat, again, tends to be lower in some of the hunter gatherers, but with some exceptions, and highest in the food producers and the Herero. And this woman is a uh, member of the Herero ethnic group. And one of the things about this group, they actually genetically are the same as these neighboring uh, Bantu-speaking populations, but they adopted pastoralism. And they also consider it to be culturally desirable for women to be very heavy. They think it's a sign of fecundity. And so I wasn't too surprised when we saw this. If we look at some metabolic traits like C-peptide, which correlates with insulin levels, Again, we tend to see hunter-gatherers at the low end, food producers at the high end. Standing glucose is not as variable, but shows similar trends. So then what um, Matt wanted to do is to look at the role, integrate this with genetic data, and see if this variation correlates with ancestry, genetic ancestry, which is indicated by the different colors here. So he looked at the proportion of the phenotypic variation explained by genetic variation using phenotype variance component fitting. And basically, the areas that are shaded would be the percentage of the variation that has a genetic component. And then that's subdivided into variation that is correlated with genetic ancestry versus within population variation. So we can see that skin color is highly heritable. It has a strong genetic component, also very correlated with uh, ancestry. We also see um, a strong genetic uh, contribution to a number of the anthropometric traits, somewhat correlated with ancestry, but not quite as much. We see a strong genetic component even for cholesterol, for triglycerides, but not for some of the other lipids and not so much for blood pressure and uh, oxygen levels. Now, we then did genotype-phenotype association studies, and this is a tiny sample size, only 2,000, but we did find some significant, genome-wide significant associations shown in red, a lot with skin color. And then we find some others for the other traits. Um, some of these replicate uh, known associations, and what's interesting is that we'll often see very different frequencies in different populations. So this A variant, for example, that's associated with higher levels of HDL is most common in the San, and it's very low in, for example, the, I think that's Nilo-Saharan pop, what is that population? No, Cushitic populations. Here's another one associated with triglycerides. And again, we see quite a bit of population variation. However, this is kind of the exception, not the rule. Typically, we don't see replication, and we find a number of novel associations. So the last thing I'm going to tell you about is our study of how people have adapted to different environments. And skin color is an example of an adaptive trait. So these um, blue circles indicate the melanin levels, and melanin is the pigment in your skin that gives it a dark color. And we can see that they correlate, that correlates very much with UV levels. And it's thought that when our ancestors left Africa within the past 80,000 years, they went to higher latitudes, there was less UV, possibly there would have been selection for lighter skin color to promote formation of um, vitamin D, which is synthesized in the skin in response to UV. And then in um, places closer to the equator, there would be selection for darker skin to be protective, for example, against skin cancer, perhaps also prevent degradation of folic acid. So to measure skin pigmentation, we use a spectrophotometer, which we shine underneath the arm, which is an area that doesn't get a lot of sunlight. And based on the wavelength of the reflection, we can infer the melanin levels. We see that there's quite a bit of variation in Africa. The most lightly pigmented population are the San, hunter-gatherers, who I told you have some of the oldest genetic lineages. 
And the most darkly pigmented people are the Nilo-Saharan pastoralists who originate from South Sudan. We then did a genome-wide association study with this very small number of people, only 1,500 or so people, and yet we found eight um, loci that showed an independent associations at four regions of the genome. I'm just going to step you through those briefly. So the strongest association was at a gene called SLC24A5, and it's a non-synonymous, a protein, amino acid changing uh, mutation. And the variant associated with light skin is shown in blue. We could see it's almost 100% frequency in Europe, and it's common in India and Pakistan, and also common in East Africa. So we wanted to know, did this arise independently in Africa, or was it introduced by migration back to Africa? One way we can do this is to look at haplotypes. So a, hapl a haplotype is how different variants are arranged along some short region of a chromosome. In this case, we're looking about 70,000 base pairs. Each haplotype is a circle, and the size of the circle indicates the number of people with that haplotype, and then the different colors represent the relative proportion in different ethnic groups. So what we can see is that there's one that this non-synonymous, this amino acid substitution, is on a haplotype background that is long and very common in uh, Eurasian, in European populations, consistent with positive selection, causing this variant to rise to high frequency. If we look in East Africa, it's on exactly the same haplotype or chromosomal background. And what that indicates is that it did not arise independently, and it was introduced by migration back into Africa, which we think occurred at least 5,000 years ago based on the current distribution. And it may have been under selection after it was introduced back to Africa. The second so strongest association was that a gene that had no name. It was just called open reading frame, whatever. <laughs> and about halfway through our study, it got a name. And I got that name based on homology to the major facilitator superfamily of transmembrane transporter proteins. Now, the only clue that we had at the time that this had anything to do with pigmentation was a study that was looking at the lightly pigmented and darkly pigmented skin from patients with vitiligo and showed that the RNA levels were very different for this particular transcript, this gene. And then my collaborator, Elena Owancia, confirmed this and also showed that it's very highly expressed in melanocytes, which is the cell type in which pigments are produced. So we found two independent associations, one of which is within this gene, MFSD12. We still don't know what the causal variants are. One of these is a non-synonymous variant, but we actually think it might either be altering gene expression or alternative splicing. We're still working on that. And we could see that the only populations that have the dark allele are those from Africa or those that have recent African ancestry, like Afro-Caribbeans and African-Americans. If we look at the other variant independently associated, it's in a predicted regulatory region about 8,000 base pairs upstream of MFSD12. And people, the light associated allele is common in Europe and East Asia, India, Pakistan, East Africa, and interestingly, very common in the sun. So we collaborated with uh, Kevin Brown at NIH. We integrated this data with a transcriptomic data set, so looking at gene expression from melanocytes of whom 15 individuals have high African ancestry. And my grad student, Derek Kelly, showed that uh, African ancestry is correlated with lower levels of expression of this gene. And the dark associated allele is correlated with lower levels of expression. A former postdoc in my lab, Marcia Beltram, used a luciferase expression assays to show that this is acting as a strong enhancer that plays a role in regulating the expression of MFSD12. Then with our collaborator, Mickey Marks and Shana Bauman at CHOP, 
they knock this out, the mRNA in mouse melanocytes. So here's what it is before knocking it out, and when you knock it out, they become darker. So it's consistent with what we were seeing from the human data. But the thing that was a little weird was that the protein did not co-localize to the melanosomes, which is where melanin is produced, but rather it was in lysosomes, so suggesting this is acting in a novel, through some novel mechanism. And then together with our collaborator, Bill Pavin at NIH, he used CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to knock this gene out in the agouti mouse and had a pretty dramatic impact. So the agouti mouse normally has a sort of reddish yellowish color and that's actually caused by a different pigment called pheomelanin. So in this particular case, this gene has the opposite effect. So when it causes pheomelanin to be high and then melanin to be low or vice versa. So when you knock it out, you see this underlying gray color. Now, when my collaborators at NIH saw this mouse, they said, you know, I think we've seen this before. <laughs> it looks really similar to this mouse that you can order from the Jackson Labs. That's called the grizzled mouse. Now, it not only has this difference in um, pigmentation, it has some other interesting phenotypes. And in the 1990s, a group tried to map this mutation to around a 2 million or so base pair region, syntenic, similar to where MFSD12 is in humans. So my collaborator, Stacy Loftus, um, sequenced the genome from these mice, and the only difference that she saw was this nine base pair in-frame deletion in exon 2 of MFSD12. So I like to say that this is a very rare example of how we used uh, human genetics or human GWAS to map a mouse mutation. <laughs> they said it couldn't be done. It's usually the opposite. Then together with my collaborator, Jean Song and Ethan Jewett, they constructed a gene genealogy. So if you unwrap this, think of it sort of like the phylogeny that I showed you. We're looking at the time to most recent common ancestry of the different genetic lineages. So at the end of these would be a sequence. Uh, and if the individuals have the light allele, it's an open circle. And if they have the dark allele, it's shown up here. Now, in this case, the ancestral allele is the one associated with the light skin color. And if you estimate the age of the derived allele, the dark allele, it's almost a million years old. So showing that both the light and the dark allele have been in Africa for a long time. The third strongest association was at a gene near a gene called DDB1. That gene plays a role in DNA uh, repair of uh, damage to DNA in response to UV. And individuals who have mutations in that gene or in genes coding for proteins that interact with that gene have a disease called xeroderma pigmentosum. They can't be exposed to sunlight because they can't repair their DNA and they're prone to getting skin cancer. Now, what does that have to do with skin color in humans? We don't know, but when I was researching this, I found out it is the gene that causes the color of tomatoes. So it is playing a role in pigmentation. We just don't know what that role is yet in humans. We again find two independent associations that are in these upstream regulatory regions. So one is near TMEM 138, about 40,000 base pairs from DDB1. The other one is a block of variants that are tightly associated over about 100,000 base pairs. So we can't say for sure what the functional variant is. This is just one candidate that's in a predicted regulatory region that interacts with the promoter of DDB1. Now, in this case, African ancestry is correlated with higher levels of uh, RNA expression, and the dark associated allele is correlated with higher levels of expression. Again, uh, we show that this is a very, very strong enhancer. The one uh, furthest upstream is uh, playing a role in gene regulation. We then wanted to see if there was a genomic footprint of natural selection. And to do that, we use a test called the Tejima's D statistic. Uh, 
And just for those who aren't familiar with this, it's based on the allele frequency distribution. So this would be, for example, the number of singletons in a population, the number of doubletons, tripletons, and so on. And under neutrality, we actually expect to see an excess of rare variants. But if it's a very large excess of rare variants, you would have a negative to GMSD statistic, and that would be what you expect under positive selection. So a variant is rapidly rising to high frequency. Now, if, on the other hand, excess variation is being maintained, then it would be positive, and that would be an indication of balancing selection, that diversity is being maintained. So Shalva integrated um, our data set with the th data from the 1,000 genomes. So this is an African genome, Chinese, European. And what we see is a very strong signature of positive selection flanking this DDB1 gene around 500 or yeah, about 500,000 base pairs. Uh, very striking in East Asians, also in Europeans. But I think it's even more striking when you look at the level of diversity in the region, the heterozygosity, which is wiped out for about 500,000 base pairs in Asians. It's pretty low in Europeans relative to Africans. And in fact, we see this very common long haplotype over about 200,000 base pairs, very common in Eurasian populations only. And if we look at the gene genealogy, what's kind of interesting is you see this rapid coalescence of lineages at around 60,000 years ago. And that co corresponds with the time of migration out of Africa. So we think that when these chromosomes were introduced during this migration out of Africa that had this variant, they swept to almost 100% frequency in some populations. We don't know why, because there are many functional genes in this region, and so it may have nothing to do with skin pigmentation. But it's one of the most striking examples of what we call selective sweep that we've seen. And then the last uh, gene region was at OCA2 and HERC2, and that wasn't a big surprise because this was known to be associated with, um, with skin color. And in fact, there had been variants found in HERC2 associated with light skin and blue eyes in Eurasians. But the variants that we found in that gene arose independently. And we showed that they impact the expression of uh, OCA2. Now, the variant within OCA2, we found a synonymous variant, so it's a, a substitution that does not cause an amino acid change in exon 10 of that gene. But it had nothing to do with gene expression. But what it did is it's correlated with the alternative splicing of this transcript. So people who have the allele associated with light skin color tend to have a shorter transcript. That transcript is missing that exon. It's an in-frame mutation. A protein is produced, but that protein is missing the entire third transmembrane domain. And you can imagine that's going to have a major impact on the phenotype. Now, in this case, we can see some evidence of positive selection in Europeans at HERC2. But at OCA2, we actually see some evidence of balancing selection in the SON, for example. And when we look at the gene genealogy, the time to most recent common ancestry is quite old. So two million years in humans is very old. Typically, we might see something more on the order of a million years, for example. It suggests that both of these alleles are being maintained for some reason for a very long time. What that reason is, we don't know yet. So in summary, at half of these loci, the variant associated with light skin is the ancestral variant. And the age of the derived mutation typically predates the origin of modern humans. 
What does that say about the evolution of skin color? This poor chimp lost its body hair, and you can see it's relatively lightly pigmented. Not all chimps, I've been told, are lightly pigmented, but um, anthropologists have speculated that this would have been the ancestral state for humans. And just to, for those who don't know, we, dif we diverged from our closest genetic relative, the chimp, within the past, say, roughly 7 million years. After our ancestors left the forest and went to the savanna, there would have been selection to decrease body hair for thermal regulation, and then there'd be selection for darker skin. But I would argue that considering that both light and dark variants are segregating in Africa for a long time, there could have been variation in Africa for quite some time. The other thing that was really surprising to me was that um, the only other place where we see the variant associated with dark skin outside of Africa is South Asia and Australomelanesia, two places where people have darkly pigmented skin. Anthropologists had speculated that this was due to what's called convergent evolution. It's a trait that arose independently in these regions because it's of uh, selection for protection from UV. But we showed that at least in these cases, the variant, the dark associated allele, originated in Africa. It was introduced during migration out of Africa and was maintained in those populations due to natural selection. I'll just mention one last signature of local adaptation in the San population from Southern Africa based on that whole genome sequence data. And what's interesting is when we look at what genes are different in that population, we see an enrichment for genes that play a role in pigmentation and also hair follicle morphology. That's interesting because the San have a very unique hair type. So they're the only ones in the world with this hair type. They have these sort of tufts, little tufts of hair, and that's something that we're following up on. So in conclusion, there's an urgent need to include ethnically diverse populations in human genomics research. We need to do a better job to understand how and why genetic risk factors for complex traits differ among ethnic groups. This is going to, going to require integration of diverse data sets. And evolutionary genetic analyses are informative for identifying functionally important variation. Um, I just want to end by telling you about um, this new center that I established in the past couple of years, the Center for Global Genomics and Health Equity. Our mission is to promote health equity through global genomics research, education, policy, and practice. We aim to facilitate integrative genomics research in underrepresented groups in the U.S. and across the globe through interdisciplinary collaboration, community partnerships, and education in translating genomics research into public policy and clinical practice to promote health equity. One of the things that we do is fund, um, we call them health equity postdocs. These are for people from groups underrepresented in the sciences, and they need to study health disparities. So if you know of any good candidates, please let me know. And I will just end by thanking the many, many people who contributed to this research and the many different funding organizations. And thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have.